the cabinet project is uh, a distributed exhibition which is all over uh, the University of Toronto campus. Two of these exhibitions are downstairs. Um, there's uh, one in uh, the physics department, uh, two in the um, Koffler building um, near the facing the uh, career center. Um, four in the Roberts Library at the, on the first floor, and uh, one more in uh, the um, University of Victoria College third floor, uh, which um, is shared. It's a, it's a, which is a space shared with another cabinet, uh, sort of cabinet project, which is the annual uh, museum, Master Museum Studies exhibition. So, um, so today uh, we are. And, and pardon me for uh, the um, very um, um, kind of not too inventive title that I found for uh, today, but <laughs> I'm arbitrarily um, putting together the artist. And uh, uh, today, the title of the artist talk and discussion is Sensing the Microbial. Please uh, welcome. Mick and Joel. So uh, Joel and I met back in UCLA in uh, 2014 uh, when I was working at the UCLA Art Science Center. Uh, and we started uh, collaborating as part of a huge team looking at um, communication of birds, uh, including it was under Victoria Vesna. And uh, since then, we've had a lot of very interesting conversations about ecology. We're both very much ecologists, uh, or artists that deal with ecology, and uh, this is the first time that we've uh, actually produced a work together as a team. So I'm excited to, to be here. Thank you, Roberta, for putting it all together. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for putting it together. <laughs> yeah. And thanks for keeping it together. <laughs> So, uh, so uh, this is our project, it's entitled Microbial Witness Atlas, um, and we wanted to start off by kind of talking about uh, the role or the identity of the witness. Uh, and many times as we see in art science discourses where the artist becomes a participant or a, a kind of, a, uh, you know, some kind, kind of um, visitor to the scientific laboratory, or vice versa, where the scientist becomes a visitor to the artistic studio, uh, we often have this condition where they become a witness to a lot of the activities that are going on. Uh, so part of our uh, uh, main contention is to find out what is the role of the witness, especially um, in observing these uh, microbiomes or these microenvironments that aren't actually uh, perceivable otherwise uh, without technoscientific tools. Uh, and what are the kind of perceptual um, what are the kind of mythologies that can be uh, that can arise from these new perceptions that we can gain into these micro uh, into these microbes? So, uh, in the words of John Ellis in his uh, book uh, *Seeing Things*, uh, basically, to witness an event is already to be responsible in some way to it. And we start our story with the um, uh, famous example of. Uh, Van Leeuwen den Hoek, who is the uh, creator of a very powerful microscope using just a small bead of glass in uh, the 1600s. Um, and so this is an image of the microscope that he created, uh, and he had to get his eye very, very close. Uh, and he was getting around 200 times magnification with this microscope, which is not compound. Uh, you know, most of the student microscopes that we see uh, in the modern age are compound microscopes with multiple lenses. But he was uh, simply using a very small bit of glass to observe microbes and draw them. And he, he met them with great sense of awe. Uh, and, and this is something that uh, really inspires us for today. We, we, we feel like um, the, the witnessing, this is a moment of kind of exchanging gazes, even though bacteria cannot uh, see. Um, we're, we're, we're thinking that uh, we're, we're considering microbes as the witness of life on this planet for billions of years. Um, and this is the, a moment in the 1600s when uh, humans are, were able to witness the bacteria back uh, and or the microbes back. And he called them animalcules, uh, little animals. And uh, yeah, which is the drawing? Yeah, well, 
He's looking at the microscope very close. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. So, you know, her question is, what, what did the microbes witness? Um, and uh, so my journey with microbes started uh, in grad school when I was looking at uh, alternative energy or renewable energy sources and uh, was working down in Mexico City uh, with a, a, a huge issue with organic waste that was being thrown in the dump and creating methane explosions on hot days. So uh, I started looking at biogas react and um, bioreactors to produce biogas. And then I uh, literally stumbled upon uh, microbial fuel cells and uh, was complete uh, in complete awe of the ability of micro microbes to produce electricity. So in a microbial fuel cell you have what's called the geobacter bacteria, or there are multiple types that have little filaments, uh, nanowires they're called, that are able to transfer electricity. Uh, so I was harnessing them in projects where I was getting a lot of advice from uh, a lab in Belgium, uh, the Laboratory of Microbial Ecology and Technology, to create these fuel cells and build theatrical situations, uh, which uh, later I learned as a kind of practice in um, micro-performativity. So it's, uh, these, these are theaters uh, for the microbes and for us. And uh, part of the uh, research is also looking at the microbes up close and, and talk to the scientists about the, the you know, structures that these microbes build and the societies that they build, so they're, they're, they're ecologies. It's not just one strain that makes these possible. There's a whole ecology of anaerobes and uh, aerob aerobic bacteria that, that allow um, the fuel cell to work. So anaerobes uh, work without oxygen, and uh, aerobes have uh, the need to produce energy using oxygen. Um, so here's just an example of some of the experiments going on. Not a lot of electricity is produced. Um, and uh, Again, continuing with these theatrical scenarios, this is a workshop with uh, students at the Natural History Museum in, uh, in Dallas. So, so I guess my into this uh, is, is really in uh, this interesting idea of interstitial ecologies. Um, I was really interested in um, the little interface uh, between us and our environments and primarily because it is that area which kind of defines uh, the body and who you are essentially. Um, so in this project uh, entitled Nanovibrancy, which I did in 2011, um, I basically created a silk eardrum uh, that was placed on the atomic force microscope in a performance where it would be sonified to a certain extent, but then you were also listening through it. Uh, and the idea was to kind of get to the, the interface, the, the smallest interface between you and the environment and to see what that sounded like. Uh, and how that boundary between yourself and the outside world could be kind of collapsed. Uh, sound, as you know, is, is made out of, of transductions, or, uh, you know, vibrations, uh, and essentially, you know, the eardrum itself, even though it's a piece of skin, it's also a very uh, kind of um, um, liminal membrane that is always in flux with its environment. So uh, I'm also very interested in global fluxes. Um, I, I've been uh, really interested in, in utilizing environmental uh, data um, and uh, ecological data, I guess, in creating narratives. Um, and this is extended, I guess, uh, in computational sonifications, um, where uh, you know, some of my work basically involves real-time wind data um, that is um, expressed in, a, in an aesthetic form. Uh, how do I get to the next slide? Um, in an installation, or perhaps uh, you know, kind of building on this idea that uh, we are always in concert, uh, in a sense, with our environment and the environmental forces. Uh, here, I'm very influenced by uh, Athanasius Kircher's uh, kind of wind-human ensemble uh, that he proposed in uh, the New Sounds in 1673, uh, where you have alien instruments in the middle, uh, but you also have live musicians that are improvising with the wind. Um, so I'm very interested to see what kind of communications uh, or conversations can happen not only with the wind as we can feel it, but also with wind or with natural um, uh, fluxes um, as kind of data today. So this is a piece uh, that I currently uh, just finished. Um, it's called Aeolian Traces, which literally tries to um, create uh, a sense of very uh, kind of natural, well, it, it tries to um, visualize, uh, I guess, human movement as alien force, 
forces. So in this piece, um, human migration data is actually used to drive the wind currents in an exhibition space. Uh, and you can see there's some visualization um, along with it as well. Um, OK, so uh, we, can, we can definitely talk more about it. But um, what is most important, um, I guess, here is that we started off talking about this project. Um, and as a kind of interstitial ecology, we were talking about the interface between skin uh, and uh, what is outside uh, and you know where it relates to uh, mixed work a lot or the dirt or you know the, uh, the micro uh, the, the micro environments that we kind of uh, live in uh, we started thinking about terrains uh, as a kind of um, a metaphor for the body uh, that the body had a terrain as well uh, but the body was also made up of uh, many many different layers uh, and as well as the terrain that was always made up of different layers as well, and the kind of fluxes that would occur when environmental forces kind of perturb these things. Uh, when aeolian forces kind of move things around, uh, when they blow sand around, they blow topsoils off, um, does that happen also with the skin? And if, if that does, does that constitute some kind of exchange of micro, uh, biome, microbial, um, 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 but does, that, does that also constitute exchanges of uh, microbial, uh, uh, um, quantities. Um, so that was our initial questioning. Um, yeah, so we were also talking a lot about the cultural context of dirt and this idea that um, dirt uh, was not necessarily uh, considered an issue until maybe about uh, 150 years ago uh, when there's a, this uh, kind of the discovery that uh, microbes cause, or, or they're pathogenic micro microbes, and then so you have uh, the development of uh, antibiotics, uh, Alexander F Fleming, and um, these this kind of warfare that is conducted against the microbial world for uh, you know, 150 years, and we're still on the tail end of that. I mean, in the kind of academic sphere, uh, people are already wise to the to the idea of the microbiome as, as being part of integral part of all kind of uh, ecological systems on the planet, but uh, the general public still thinks that you know microbes are are bad and need to be um, removed at all costs. And we're still seeing uh, the development of superbugs uh, from uh, the over administration of antibiotics. So um, we're we're basically positing that uh, this is the, the beginning of a time where we we go back to uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's sense of wonder and awe at the microbiome. Um, and it's very exciting. And also going back to a kind of relationship to the dirt that is, uh, that is uh, kind of uh, reverential. So the idea of geophagy is, was one thing we were talking a lot about, eating dirt or placing dirt on your body. Um, these are ancient practices that uh, are, are now being researched as potential um, probiotic treatments. Um, and um, so the other thing that we were also talking about is in this title is the second meaning of the word atlas uh, as holding up the world, but in this case microbes holding up the living world, right, um, being the kind of keystones for life on this planet. Um, so I actually live in Mexico now as of a few months, um, and I've been visiting there on and off for uh, number of years, and one of the interesting sites to me is uh, Chimayo, which is a site of Catholic pilgrimage, uh, which is renowned for having healing dirt. Now, um, as to whether this is true or not, I'm still not certain, but uh, it's it, to me, it really does represent this cultural relationship to dirt, the, the idea that of, of dirt as having the potential to cure, as opposed to uh, being something that we need to uh, eradicate. Um, and so I actually went and collected some dirt from this site and uh, started to conduct some experiments with that and other dirt samples, including one that we, will, we uh, have here, which is uh, a dirt sample, well, a microbe cultured from the dirt, um, Nitrosomonas uh, eutropha. And uh, it's actually from a company called uh, Aobiome, or Mother Dirt. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Uh, and it's a bit controversial still, but uh, we're, we're interested in that. Um, and also the relationship to Chimayo and belief, right? Um, so uh, we, we encourage everybody here to take a vial of mother dirt. Um, 
Yeah, very much like we, you would do at Chimayu, you take some dirt and you can like just place it in, a, in an area and think about all of the amazing curative pro properties that it has and never use it, or you can put it on your armpit and see what happens. So, um, <laughs> so I did this um, over the course of a few days and, uh, and then cultured the soil. This is, I, I'm not gonna show you all the experiments, but uh, what the soil from Chimayo looked like cultured uh, first and then cultured on my arm. Uh, yeah, and uh, I would like to run some actual tests and send it to him uh, for a metagenomic analysis because this is one of the technologies that Roberto kind of hinted at earlier. Metagenomics is really driving this investigation of the microbiome and the, the interest in it. Uh, it's uh, without being able to actually sequence all of these microbes, um, you, you really don't see very, very many in a cultured plate. So we're probably seeing 1% of the microbes that were in that dirt culture. Um, and, uh, let's see, right oh yeah, right. Uh, yeah, so these are cabinets downstairs, and uh, we wanted to thank Eric and uh, um, the, the UTIC collection here for um, loaning the microscope to our, one of our cabinets, uh, this is the, the bronze microscope. Um, and I guess Eric could probably say more about that, but. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it was a microscope probably used by a student in the early 1900s, is that about right now? Yeah, 1920s, maybe to the 1940s. Yeah. Um, and the idea behind our, our cabinets is really to create a, a, a series of mythologies, so we uh, encourage people to read these mythologies that are kind of fictional accounts about the microbiome because every day new things are being discovered, so we're, we're, we're pushing that. Uh, series of myths, and uh, you want to talk about that? Sure, talk about the elements, yeah. So there's a kind of uh, microbial Toronto map and a story that goes with that. Um, the Chimayo experiments, uh, the microscope as a, as a nod to the development of optics for observing the microbial world. Um, the Books, which also are accompanied by a story uh, of uh, about the book eaters, uh, a microbiome from uh, termite gut um, that is able to dissolve the cellulose of books, and um, the chimayo dirt itself, right there. And I guess in the in the second cabinet we have uh, dirt itself. Uh, and we also have uh, an interesting kind of mist that is created. Uh, from a bit of a suspended uh, particles of this uh, monitor sample. Uh, and we also have uh, some mythologies about um, uh, uh, Polaromonas uh, eolata who, that actually rides on the wind uh, and ends up in different ecologies and ends up in the weather as well and, and, and causes it to rain or to shine. Um, and these are some of the mythologies uh, that we have. I would encourage you to go down and read them. Uh, we don't probably don't have time to read them now, but uh, yeah. Okay, that, that's us. Thank you very much. two definitions of atlas, but it does strike me as artists producing these works or artists, scientists producing these works, that it's hard to get beyond the fact that atlas has been a title that's been so deeply implicated in, in a variety of different artistic practices through the later part of the 20th century. Did you also have that in mind as you were sort of layering this material together? Yes, for sure. Um, it, so the project, this, what you see downstairs is the tip of the iceberg of the research. And so the title came before the cabinets were done. And it is really the beginning of the atlas of a kind of compendium of analyses. So the atlas is both mythological and research-based for us. And it is related to a series of artistic practices and also 
on Psy art practices, uh, including uh, Christina Agapakis, I worked real much with in uh, the UCLA, and she was doing metagenomic profiles of soil along the Pacific Coast Trail um, and creating an atlas essentially uh, of clear examples. So that is, yeah, definitely a big part of it. But what about the sort of stream of atlas, artistic atlas projects that don't necessarily deal with science? but frame themselves in some of the ways that you're talking about. Like, are, do, I'm just trying to get us to what, get to whether you've thought about those as well. Like, you're framing in terms of artistic practices that are always quite explicitly linked to science. Mm -hmm. But then there are these other artistic practice, practices that aren't particularly focused centrally on science, but still use this matter of the atlas. So I guess I'm thinking about <laughs> Gerhard Richter, Wally Brad, people mm -hmm. like that. Are you are you guys also sort of implicating that kind of work into the project? Because I I could see a really beautiful way of writing that into your project, but I'm curious to know if that's in your was in your mind. I, you know, I, I don't think that was part of what we were thinking. Um, okay. We had a pretty conventional or I guess what we was talking about definition for atlas. You, you know, at this point, the fans come on, I can't hear a word I, I mean, there, there, there are definitely a lot of those layers in here, but I think at the, at the main, oh yeah, uh, at, the, at the main layer, we were mostly focusing on the art and science aspects, yes. Uh, but of course, uh, New Geographies is a big influence, uh, the um, kind of investigation of uh, geography through um, research practices that aren't necessarily science-based, yeah, so. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And that's something that could be a good thing. Take this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, the, yeah, <laughs> now she's making it. The next speaker is uh, Nicole Gluston. For those people who haven't seen her work, uh, it is uh, at the Koffler uh, uh, Student Career Center. Um, it's, well, you, you have pictures, so like she'll describe it. So. Thanks. I'll, I'll pass you the mic. Yes, okay. Um, I'll put it on. I'll Let's see. Is that working? Can you hear me? Is that okay. fine? All right. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, wonderful. So first off, I'd also like to thank everyone who made the Cabinets Project possible. Of course, Roberta and Stephen and all the wonderful volunteers. And thanks, of course, for inviting us all to speak about our work. I'm, as Roberta mentioned, Nicole Houston. I'm a current PhD student at the York University. And I'm going to kind of talk to you about my work with mud and how I came to be interested in working with microbial life. So in my current practice-based research, I engage mud as my medium in order to expose the vast array of microbial life within it, as well as the ways that we are physically connected to it. So my research really involves harvesting mud and placing it within these thin acrylic prisms that I create uh, alongside nutrients that encourage microbial growth. And when exposed to light, the microbes that are already present in the soil begin to flourish and become visible in the form of these kind of brightly colored patches or um, layers throughout the columns. So my work, work with mud really arose out of this desire to engage microbial life, which has really been the focus of my practice over the past four years. Um, microbes, as we've already sort of been discussing, are life forms that are visible to the naked eye. Um, they form vast, complex communities around, on, and within our bodies. And in fact, we have 10 times more microbial cells than human ones. And they pass in and out of our bodies, really permeating what we perceive to be that fleshy barrier between ourselves and everything else. So obviously kind of connected to what our previous speakers were talking about in terms of that connection between our environment and 
what we might consider to be just us. So this community of microbes nourishes us, they help to feed us, they protect us from pathogens, they help us produce vitamins, and much more that we're just still trying to understand. Microbial life is really essential to the planet. Uh, bacteria drive planetary cycles of carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Photosynthetic bacteria in the oceans clean our air and our water. And although the microbial life that's growing in my work isn't directly from our bodies, I really hope that it calls attention to those microbes, that complex web of microbes that we're really dependent upon. So my research can be described as bioart, which is a field in which artists investigate biology by employing the tools and techniques of the life sciences. So I like to think of it as using biological matter as an artistic medium and using the medium of life to discuss life. Um, and so it's within this field of art science that I'm grappling with quite a few questions, particularly surrounding our interconnectedness. So I'm interested in whether encounters with microbial life can help us come to a greater understanding of our relationship with the ecosystem as a whole. Um, how can we appreciate the biotic and abiotic matter around us as lively and important through microbial life? And what can happen when we acknowledge through an embodied experience our connection to these microbes? And what are the implications of that connection? So this kind of journey all started when I was a sufferer. Um, so in order to kind of grapple with that, I started working with them on found graph paper. So I did a series of microbial drawings. And it's interesting to reflect back on that time because I can really tell that I was really thinking of microbes as these fascinating invaders, as kind of a beautiful threat, but definitely not as integral parts of our world. I still very much focused on them as pathogens that could invade the body in kind of a sublime way, but we're very much still kind of the enemy. So as author Ed Young describes in his book, I Contain Multitudes, which actually the other presenters lost. <laughs> um, microbes are so now commonly associated with dirt and disease that if you showed someone the multitudes that live in their mouths, so this is microbes and spit, um, they will probably recoil in disgust. So this prejudice really wasn't present when microbes were first discovered. And I'm also going to talk about Anthony von Lucha who was delighted when he saw microbes for the first time. He actually exclaimed, I then most always saw with great wonder that in said matter, there were many, very many little living animalcules, very prettily and moving. And he was quite excited that all the people living in our United Netherlands are not as many as the living animals I carry in my own mouth this very day. So I similarly kind of want to return to that awe and the excitement and the curiosity about microbial life. So as I kind of learn more about the human microbiome and this complex relationship we had, my relationship with microbes became much more nuanced. I came to kind of acknowledge this much more beneficial and rich relationship we have with them. And then the focus of my work really shifted as well. Um, I was interested very much so in the capacity for microbial life to transcend perceived barriers um, and reveal how connected we are. Microbial life moves between our bodies, between each other, between animals, water, the soil, air, the building around us. And they just connect everything quite literally in a vast network. And this view of microbes was really reinforced when I started working with them directly. Around this time, I started looking at the artwork of other bioartists, and this kind of helped me take that leap into actually working with microbes. I was working with them representationally through the drawings, but became quite dissatisfied with that approach and realized that I really needed to be working with the actual living material if I wanted to reflect on it. And this is artist Anna Dimitriou, who's a UK-based bioartist, and her journey as someone with a, a background as a painter who then came into the field of bioart with absolutely no scientific training 
and then has come to become one of the more well-trained sort of uh, non-biologists with really high level lab clearance in all these really interesting places. And so her work, so this is one of her pieces, MRSA cult, where she has uh, dyed the quilt using MRSA uh, and then sterilized it. Obviously work that has to be done within a lab environment. But her journey really inspired me to start to work with this material directly. And I unfortunately did not have access to kind of a state-of-the-art lab. So what I started doing was just looking up do-it-yourself type of techniques, right? So things I could do safely, not going to grow some sort of intense superbug, um, where I knew kind of that I would be able to work with the microbial life, but at a level that was safe in my studio environment. So I came across the Winogradsky column, which is a really simple experiment meant to culture and ecology of microbes. So Sergio Winogradsky actually invented the column because he was interested in studying microbial life holistically. So rather than just isolating one bacteria, he wanted to see how they actually interacted together. So he did this quite simple experiment where <coughs> fill a column with mud, put nutrients in it, and allow it to grow. So basically the same sort of methodology that I'm using in my own work. And you can see in the illustration that a sulfide and an oxygen gradient is created. And so different microbes will grow approximately at different levels. And depending on their location as well as their tone, you can get a good sense of, of what they are. So I started using this technique in order to, for myself, engage with mud and engage with microbes. Um, I similarly was inspired by the beauty of the work, but then also by this idea of studying microbes holistically. And that's something that's really resonated as I continue with my work. So moving on towards the cabinet project, this is sort of the prisms that you'll see if you go to the cabinet. So this is the mud which I harvested from Lake Ontario, actually, as closely directly down from uh, UFT campus as I possibly could. I originally was going to maybe dig up some mud, actually in Queens Park, but um, there wasn't quite the right amount of rain slash unthawing of the land. <laughs> yeah, so we ended up. I ended up going to Lake Ontario. Um, so this is the mud right after it's placed into the columns. And this is it a couple weeks later. So you can really see in the in the water, which is what's in the kind of upper section of the column, quite a few differences are already forming. And then this is a couple weeks right before they were installed. And you can kind of start to see like little patternings throughout the surface, which would be bacteria and other microbes. And then this is the work installed in the call in the cabinets. So throughout the exhibition, the microbial life will continue to flourish and grow, which is why I think it's so interesting to have it in a public space where there's going to be people passing by maybe just once, and so they're experiencing that work for that moment. But then there's other individuals who maybe work in the building or going to school who will get to encounter it more often and actually see those shifts happening on the surface. I mean, for me personally, I'm really interested in again, this connection that microbes make between our bodies and the environment. And focusing on soil is a way for me to really get away from the very human-centric way we're thinking about microbes quite often. We really talk a lot about the human microbiome. Um, and so working with environmental microbes, I'm interested in expanding that conversation. But also I'm really open to people simply perceiving mud as beautiful. So I think that could be a really good first step, right? So if somebody walks by the cabinet and all they really get out of it is that they're perceiving mud as having beauty to it. I think that just fostering that recognition of a material that we often consider really lowly and undesirable is something that we consider beautiful can be a really valuable experience for someone. So currently I'm also working on another project that engages mud which I am calling the Lake Ontario Portrait. 
And I was lucky enough to be invited to work in the Coalesce BioArt Lab at the University of Buffalo. So during my time there, I was traveling between Toronto and Buffalo along Lake Ontario and really feeling this connection between crossing the border and these two distinct sides of the lake that we've created. And so I decided that I would drive around the lake and collect mud from 15 locations surrounding the lake. So these locations were partially determined by trying to get a good spacing around the lake, as well as trying to find places where I could actually get to the water, um, and hopefully close enough that I don't have to carry the bucket of mud too far away from the shore to my car. And so I have some images of the locations. Here's the bucket and my shovel. And so I just drove around the lake for two days collecting mud. And these are some of the various landscapes that I, locations that I collected them from. As I was doing this project, the landscape and place ended up becoming a lot more integral than I expected it to. Up until this point, I was really kind of collecting mud at locations that were important but also convenient. And so driving around the lake and encountering these landscapes that I hadn't ever seen before necessarily or really known how I was going to grapple, that relationship with the land in a specific place came to be very important, which is why I ended up actually taking these images. And this exhibition is still in progress, but it will be displayed at York University uh, in the beginning of May. So I'm still grappling with exactly how these images will come into play, but I'm considering them to be uh, in an artist book alongside the, the mud work. So just go through at Tobacco, where I gathered some mud. I also took a series of short videos, kind of documenting the weather that I was ex kind of grappling with and the sounds in that particular place. So then sort of the process of placing the mud, so this is mud after it was harvested and brought back to the University of Buffalo. Here is placing the mud within the columns. And again, a similar experience where when the mud is first placed within the sculptures, it is quite similar. Um, and there isn't a lot of total differences. But in this instance, because the mud was from so many different locations, there certainly were shifts right away. So this is immediately after it was placed. And this is shortly, about a couple days after. And you can already see quite a few tonal differences forming. And this is the work before it started growing in the greenhouse, and then after a month of growth. So you really see the vibrancy that's formed by the, the piece and the microbes within it. So as part of this residency, one of the things I'm really fortunate to do is some genomic testing. So sending out samples from the columns for high throughput sequencing. So at this point, I am using the wine recipe technique to sort of get an idea of what's actually happening in the column. But it is based on tone. It's based on approximately where they're growing. And it certainly isn't exact. So being able to go and see and test exactly what is happening in the columns, I'm really looking forward to making very direct associations between what's growing within them and what's growing potentially on our bodies, within our bodies, and in our direct environment, and making that more literal for a viewer. So this is the work, which has uh, now been growing for about three months and is in my studio. Luckily, it made it across the border. Um, so it, it's here. <laughs> And I just kind of want to end on stating that my interest in microbial life has really led me to consider the implications of their presence. The fact that microbial life can exist in a very little, literal way to each other, as well as our ecosystem, and reminds us of the very enmeshed nature of our bodies. And I'm interested in continuing to explore how that can foster a more empathetic relationship with our ecosystem as a whole as well as try to decentralize our place as humans at the top of the pyramid, and instead think of ourselves as more 
lateral and in relationship with the rest of the world. <laughs> Thank you for some static. <laughs> okay, so we have our last speaker, who is Nicole Liao. Um, her work is uh, on a display at the University of Victoria College on uh, the first floor. Um, and uh, uh, it deals with something that is not as microbial as as microscopic as um, uh, it was the, the work of the previous speakers, but nonetheless it's something that is very sneaky, <laughs> just to say. Um, so, um, yeah, okay. Uh, in the meantime, I really encourage people to go back several times to see uh, Nicole Cluston's work, MUD, uh, because it changes over time. So, like, it's already changed and it's very vibrant. And I also encourage you to take the track to uh, University of Victoria College and uh, uh, see the glory of the work. Is it? I think it's uh, is this one? Is that okay. Uh oh. Um, I think that uh, the images are on that computer. Uh, do you have the password? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, James and Andrea from the Gage Institute for speaking with me, Roberta for being so amazing and accommodating me to getting me to speak to the right people, and um, Eric, of course, for letting me come in every Wednesday night <laughs> to look at the instruments that I was studying. Um, so the, the piece uh, that I have, it's called Dust Counters and Gas Collectors, which is literally just the instruments that I was working on. Um, basically, uh, I, I was interested in um, working with instruments from the Division of Occupational Environmental Health uh, in the Gage Building, uh, which was originally a, a sanatorium, which was um, established to study and research tuberculosis. Um, the irony is, though, that this, this piece that I'm working on has nothing, very little to do with the microbial. It has to do with its opposite, which is um, uh, the substances, the inert substances that affect occupational health and um, lung-related lung related diseases. Um, so I, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I don't work directly with microbes, unfortunately, which sounds really fascinating, but I, I am really interested in the history um, of <clears throat> objects, um, uh, specifically the untold story of um, what goes, uh, the untold story of, of, of these objects that I was looking at. Um, so these are books that I was reading. One of them actually belongs to James, called Dust and Its Dangers, <laughs> which was uh, published in 1890, um, where um, this was at the height of you know, um, the Industrial Revolution, where new manufacturing technology is um, creating products that have, at, at an incredible scale, but at the same time killing off the workers or affecting the workers who were uh, employed in these factories, employed in these mines, etc. Um, I, I bring up this slide by Duchamp um, called Dust Breeding. Um, well, probably a lot of the artists in the room know about this 
piece. <laughs> this is photographed by Man Ray. Uh, this is actually um, dust um, that Duchamp deliberately collected onto his glass painting called the, Bra the Bride Stripped oh, Bear of His Bachelor. No. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> Anyways, um, so you know the piece, but I, but, you know, I look at it in a whole new way. Um, I see it as, as an enormous glass slide um, for analysis. Um, the, these these uh, are actually, this is part of one of the instruments that I was looking at from the Gage Institute. Um, there are slides that um, collect dust samples uh, which can be counted. So they are literally used to count dust. Um, and this measurement um, was meant to, uh, you know, count the number of particles per cubic centimeter to determine, you know, the dust levels in a factory or workplace. Um, so this is a this is part of the same instrument uh, where you would draw dust into this um, this instrument. And these particles would be caught on the slide, and from there uh, you could observe and count these particles um, to see, you know, uh, what that density was. Um, this is a diagram, an air sampling diagram, which um, documents the uh, the size of these particulates that uh, could be affecting um, a person's body. Um, the smaller the particulate, um, the more it'll affect the lungs because it can actually penetrate the body. So um, this next slide, um, uh, you know, it's, these are one of the books that I feature in, in the cabinet that I've put up. Um, th this is a vein of ore uh, containing asbestos fibers. Um, the way they counted asbestos fibers was similar. They used microscopy to determine um, their density. Um, so I'm, I'm actually just going through the instruments that I was researching and carefully looking at and reading about, um, and that I've, you know, that sort of fascinated me and got me thinking more about the history behind them. Um, again, uh, some of you are already very familiar with it, some of you are not. Uh, this here is an Anderson air sampler, so it measures particles according to size distribution and mass. Um, so it's a cascade impactor that, uh, again, you draw air in and the particles, um, basically they, they fall uh, according to uh, different sizes. So each level um, has, uh, you know, a different type of particle. So the heaviest particles fall at the top while the lightest particles fall to the bottom. And each level is associated with a different region of the respiratory tract. So of course, the smaller the particle, um, you know, the more invasive it is in terms of, of affecting the lungs. Um, I will say that they do use this uh, version. They do use another version to uh, measure viable bacteria. So uh, maybe that's the one, like <laughs> the one, the one thing that's kind of related to the other two artists. Um, so instead of these uh, <clears throat> these plates, you can. They use petri dishes in, instead, which is pretty fascinating. But fortunately, it's, I didn't look too deeply into that part. The viable sampler. Um, again, this is a, another instrument that they would have used in mines. It's a gra gravimetric dust counter. Um, so this device, if you're following the diagram, it um, removes. Uh, it was especially used in coal mines, where they would remove um, these dust particles by pumping air into the machine. And then um, the larger dust particles would settle out while the smaller dust particles that can enter the inner lung, um, they, they fall into, they, get, they absorb into the filter and then that filter can be subsequently weighed. <clears throat> so it's very useful for, for uh, coal dust. Um, uh, you know, another um, product that I, I came upon that I was pretty fascinated with is like the history of cotton, um, which at one point, you know, really drove like the British Empire in terms of, um, uh, you know, the, the profits that they made off this material. Um, thanks to, you know, the technology, these new factories, um, again, you know, uh, 
they were produced at such a mass scale that uh, there was no proper ventilation, there was uh, no proper, you know, uh, protection from, say, um, these fine particles when they would card it by removing the um, the um, particles or the the non cotton particles. That um, what would happen, of course, is that people would start suffering from something called bisonosis, which is um, also called brown lung. Uh, the the instrument here is actually a vertical elutriator, um, and this instrument actually um, is used specifically for you know uh, cotton dust uh, to measure the amount of cotton dust in the air. <coughs> um, this next slide uh, are quartz crystals. Um, I only bring this up to bring up um, the next uh, element that uh, was quite prominent in studying these instruments, which is sand. Um, so whereas the two other artists were dealing with dirt, and um, dirt as being this living, breathing thing, uh, silica sand actually is a kind of its opposite. Um, it contains quartz crystals. Uh, which, when ground to a very fine powder, um, really damages the lungs and causes um, uh, a condition called silicosis, which for a long time, because um, people, because the symptoms are so similar to those uh, people suffering from TB, um, the uh, silica, the, the cause of industrial disease, was kind of ignored, and um, people were insistent that it had to do with bacteria. Um, when in fact it really had to do with um, silica dust, um, either you know, as a result of mining, as a result of um, core making, in this case mold making. They use a lot of sand to create those, um, those molds. Um, you know, there's uh, the instruments that they use for mining, they use these pneumatic instruments that are you know, very efficient, very powerful, but also um, create a lot more uh, finer particles that affect the body. Um, I will say this uh, in relation to the other two artists, um, I am very concerned about um, the way our body interacts with the environment. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is just another product. Glass, bl glass blowing apparently was also a problem in terms of um, how they were affected. Obviously, sand is silica sand is also used to manufacture glass. Um, and uh, then, of course, there's construction, drilling. Um, this is a, a tunnel um, called Hawk's Nest Tunnel. Um, and I, I, I bring this up um, because this issue of worker safety has uh, never left us. Um, and this is taken back in the 1930s in the states where um, 2,000 workers in West Virginia drilled a, a, a tunnel that was 3.75 miles long for a hydroelectric plant. Um, and they were asked to mine the mineral silica, uh, and um, at least a thousand of them died from silicosis as a result. Um, so it's uh, this is a well-known disa industrial disaster in the United States. It's considered one of the worst in, in its history. Um, there are many more, of course, but this is um, one of the first that really uh, brought up legislation. Um, this is a Robert Smithson piece, <laughs> one of the few that I found that actually takes place in an interior as opposed to like the wide open, um, you know, land art that we're all familiar with. But uh, I, you know, Robert Smithson, of course, and all those land artists are always at the back of my mind when I was um, thinking about these, these, um, you know, these industrial disasters. And I'm sure it was that in the back of their mind as well, since he was obsessed with entropy. Um, uh, this book is a book of photographs by Peter McCallum. He's actually a uh, he's a, a Canadian photographer, I believe, and um, this is a rubber processing plant um, in Toronto. Uh, I think this was taken in the '80s, I believe. But um, I was uh, but I was really struck by um, you know like the the physicality I think of you know these bodies. Um, moving material constantly all day. Um, I think we tend to forget that, you know, the products that we have, you know, even like our iPhones that contain 
minerals that allow us to run these electronics, um, they come from somewhere, and they come from somebody's uh, sweat and labor, and um, it's kind of, uh, it, it's, it's one of those things that we, we just never think about. Um, Ontario has its own disaster, which is um, the uranium mines. Um, so I, I just brought, bring up this, uh, this, <clears throat> this news article on the wildcat strike that took place in 1974. Um, these uranium miners also suffered from silico silicosis and uh, uh, radiation and cancer from, from radiation poisoning. Um, and it was because of this strike that we have the um, OHS, which is the Occupational Health and Safety Legislation in Ontario. Um, because before that industry and the government um, simply did not um, you know, listen to these workers. Uh, and as recently as 2012, South Africa, and it's still ongoing, South, South Africa, South African miners have brought a lawsuit against um, a bunch of gold companies, um, again, for uh, silicosis. Um, so, <laughs> so it's kind of a grim topic, but something that I, you know, I found fascinating and also something that tends to get buried. Um, in the news, we're so obsessed with um, environmental health in general for the public, but um, occupational health isn't something that we think too much about. Um, I'm bringing up this uh, another piece by Duchamp. Uh, this is a carbon monoxide detector uh, that's also in the cabinet um, that's featured. Um, just some pamphlets that accompanied it. Um, which I quite love. Uh, these are, and, and often, you know, the, the idea that these gases that we deal with, um, I'm dealing with gases and air and vapors now, they're often invisible, often colorless, um, so they, they have these instruments to, to try and detect um, <clears throat> these poisonous gases and um, establish thresholds so that um, they can take the proper safety measures. Um, again, this is an, another Duchamp piece in collaboration with Man Ray. Um, it's uh, on the cover of the Surrealist magazine called View magazine. Um, so in English, I believe the translation is when the tobacco smoke is also in the mouth that exhales it, the two odors marry by infrathin. So it, it doesn't really make sense, but it kind of does. Um, I, I mean, I, I like this image only because it shows that, our, that, the, that the line between our bodies and the air is simply, um, in a way, it's liminal, right? Like, it's, it's, our bodies are constantly absorbing what's around us and vice versa. Um, so we'll run through, any, anyhow, there's a few more instruments. A multi-gas detector um, used to detect leaks. Um, an organic vapor monitor, uh, which is basically a cartridge that you wear around your your body, and then you put it back into the canister, mail it back for analysis. Um, this is just a close-up of a diagram of one of the um, indicator tubes that will react um, using a colorant to the toxic gas that it's uh, supposed to be measuring. Um, it's a hydrocyanic acid gas detector, uh, hydrocyanic, is it hydro, yeah, it's, um, sorry, it's, it's hydrocyanic acid, hydrogen cyanide um, is, um, it's a precursor to sodium cyanide and potassium cyanide, which is used to extract gold and silver um, and, and, and for, for, for miners. Um, Anyhow, I so I'm I'm gonna end soon. Um, I because nobody like I I just got the images of my actual piece from <laughs> it's from Roberta. I did not have time to take images of my own piece, but I will say this: um, I I did struggle uh, with these instruments in trying to uh, figure out a way to communicate like the importance of these instruments that are used in occupational safety and how important they are to, um, you know, our lives. Um, and I, you know, I, 
I always come back to um, Martha Rosler somehow because <laughs> uh, language is so difficult. Um, anyhow, uh, I will end with so this is this is one piece part of the cabinet. I will jump to Roberta's <laughs> lovely images <laughs> of the actual piece so you might get an idea of what I've been talking about. <laughs> um, so is there a way to just preview? So, so this is the piece that's up in Victoria College. Um, the pile to the left is not dirt not quite dirt, it's silica sand. Um, the pile to the right, it's, uh, it's actually raw cotton. Um, so I, you know, I deal with images and, and, and books. Um, and the piece is also, also deals with this problem of language and representation. Um, so uh, as you can see, there's text on two sides. Um, one side just deals with all the actions that uh, workers engage in, in terms of, you know, digging, cutting, blasting, um, dragging, dipping, etc. Um, and then uh, the other half of the cabinet um, basically lists all the terms that were used to describe these um, occupational diseases uh, starting back in the 19th century into the present. Um, so uh, I think it's probably easiest to like see the piece itself <laughs> to, to fully grasp um, you know uh, what I've been doing or what I what I was researching and trying to um, I guess show uh, and I'll just end there thanks very much for listening Photoshopping because uh, uh, the cabinet is right in front of a, a door, and there were exams, and people kept opening and closing the door, so there was this huge glare. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, okay. Uh, so, so right. Uh, oh well, you can stay here because we are gonna open the discussion. Um, so, um, and so you understand that. Uh, uh, all these works um, by uh, Mick and Joel uh, and the Tunico have been uh, possible uh, because of a lot of uh, uh, collaboration with uh, the scientific uh, counterpart. And especially um, uh, Nicole was uh, uh, very lucky to, <laughs> to be assisted by uh, um, two scientists from uh, the Gage Institute, uh, which is part of the Dalai Lama School of Public Health. Um, so I'm uh, inviting uh, here um, all the panelists, uh, all, the, all the presenters, and uh, I would like to invite also James Scott and Andrea Saskatchewan. Uh, That's good, okay. <laughs> to uh, sit here and to start a discussion. And uh, also, um, in the early um, uh, stages, and also later on, uh, of uh, um, um, Mick and Joel's uh, work, they were looking for a microbiologist. And actually, I put out a call. And David Kim was very nice to send us a lot of information about uh, uh, the microbiome. And he sent us like links to articles and everything. So we invited him, too. And we invite him to uh, sit in our panel uh, together with uh, Nicole, Nicole, uh, Mick, and Joel. So please come here. <laughs> <laughs> and now, <laughs> so um, one of one of the things, yeah, I know it's, it's like a big group, but one of, one of the things that I I was really struck by uh, the work was not so much the similarities, but the fact that um, there's something about the um, dealing with something that we don't see. And it's either not seen because it is uh, uh, very um, um, ethereal, like um, silica and um, air and dust, uh, which is leaking into your lungs and that makes you sick, or like the, the microbes, which are not visible, although you can 
see them in uh, big colonies, um, and uh, and they they really show up with like fantastic colors, but only when they are in like millions of uh, items uh, uh, altogether. So um, I would like to start uh, uh, this uh, discussion with this and and asking everybody to to kind of reflect on. Um, this fascinate, like I think that this fascination with the the microscopy, but also with the like ethereal and uh, the the sneaky and the, the <laughs> I know I I, I kind of call it otherwise, um, like how how it it really catches our attention and uh, how um, we can actually like the the. the the work of these artists actually made it more visible, or made it more, um, um, I don't know, live, um, lively in some in some way. So I would like to to open the discussion by this, and it's generate on purpose so that we can actually like shape the conversation as we want, and then we'll open to the public. Um, I don't know about. Oh, I can I can I can actually. Circulated this. Unfortunately, we only have one. So. Who wants to start? <laughs> so, so I think you you sort of hit the nail on the head when you said that um, uh, that these things that sort of uh, are the the common thread through all of these works. Uh, are things that we don't see, and yet they have, I guess, lives or they have existence. Um, the thing that's really interesting, though, that, that distinguishes the two works that were microbial works from the last work, which was not microbial, it was uh, gases and particles, is this idea that microbes can announce themselves, um, and and they do that. Uh, by their form uh, on mass, but moreover, they do that by the odors that they produce, they do that by the taste that they produce. They have ways of interacting with our perception uh, that allows us to understand their existence. Um, so we do interface with them, uh, with the knowledge that we're interfacing with them. In the last work, it's different in the sense that, that most of those agents, things like asbestos fibers, or gases like carbon monoxide, uh, they can't announce themselves. Or at least when they do, the announcement comes quite a bit later <laughs> after our interaction with them. <laughs> so the thing that I find really miraculous about those those artifacts that Nicole showed is that, that to stand and look at them, they look like these mundane artifacts that you could kind of imagine would do anything. Like they might uh, be used to sort of uh, coat powder on the surface of something, or they might be used in a printer shop, or they could be used for any particular purpose. But what they are, are portals for us to be able to interact with those things in an immediate way. And that's what's really, really striking about those things. It, they're, they're means by which we can take ourselves and our scale, and we can shrink ourselves and become Su sufficiently small that we can that we're now on the landscape of those things and we can interact with them. So that's what I felt really striking about those objects and they really have interesting stories as well. So I'll pass this over to someone else. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't have a lot of elegant things to say, but <laughs> I, I just want to just say that it's it's very. Um, I'm amazed and happy that, um, like the Mick and Joel's work, and, um, and a lot of work that's been done recently about how appreciating the microbial world around us, and just not just seeing them as something that's dangerous to us, but often they are very beneficial to us, part of our body, um, part of our what we are, as well as so helping us in some ways and just really letting us also enjoy um, and make use of things that we would never have, we, we would have never been able to do, such as something simple like fermentation, which let us, it's all work of microbial um, communities. 
So something like that to, um, and sometimes they can cause sickness, but the fact that they're so integral to us and now people are understanding more and this idea that we are living with microbes uh, is getting more popular and that they're not just pathogens that we should avoid, I'm really glad that that kind of notion is changing. And I think this kind of events are just kind of bringing more of that to the public and very happy about that. And I'm happy that I somewhat contributed a little bit to that. <laughs> um, I guess the only thing I would add right now is that uh, in fact, it's, it's quite interesting that uh, in the world of occupational health, uh, we were concerned about gases and vapors and dusts. Uh, back 40, 50 years ago, I don't think anybody seriously was worried about the microbial hazards that were also in workplaces because the size or the magnitude was so much smaller, we just didn't really think about it. So now, um, James and I are both involved in uh, training people, to, uh, teaching at the master's level, people who are going to go out and uh, do occupational health. Now there's a real push to also include the biological hazards as well as the chemical and the physical hazards that we've historically dealt with for years and years. So I think that's kind of interesting too. One other thing that I, I, I been um, impressed by, well, impressed, not very positively impressed by, was this um, mad focus on uh, um, kind of the concerns that have been uh, brought about uh, um, the, the danger of uh, uh, bacteria for human beings only and not for other organisms, so just for human beings. So, so like there's uh, issues of safety and uh, and uh, um, um, like security that come into play. So when, uh, as soon as uh, um, bacteria, the word bacteria is uh, uh, mentioned, but at the same time, when we are talking about dust and uh, um, um, and gas, we are somehow less freaking out about it, and, I'm, and I've been wondering why this is happening. Why are we not concerned about, like for example, there was the scare of uh, the medical building with the uh, asbestos. Only now there's this concern, only because they, they found it. But before, everybody was like doing their, their work and, and nobody was caring about, assuming that it was gone. And, uh, and I think there's a little bit, like, because we know a little bit more about it, maybe we, we think we are safer. While with bacteria, because we don't see them, and because it, they are somehow new, we are kind of uh, um, taking precautions at any, any time. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment on that. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, but I think it really comes down to a question of agency, and which is a, a question that Joel and I were dealing with a lot in our thinking. Uh, so bacteria, we I think one reason that we uh, oftentimes react in that way is because they are agents, they are live, they are harder to control or to fully understand the complexity of those communities. When you're talking about a, a particulate, it's uh, I think it's easier to get wrap your rational mind around a particle and the effects that it would have on the body and how to control it and contain it. So. Yeah, I mean, I would echo the fact that I think we have a fairly rational fear of pathogens. Like, obviously there is need for safety and need for concern to a certain extent, but it certainly does, I think, become maybe overblown, where we are con constantly in fear of bacteria rather than kind of recognizing there are actually fewer than a hundred species of bacteria that are particularly pathogenic to humans in contrast to the many, many millions of species that are, are not. So, and I would absolutely agree with that uh, note on agency, the idea that there's a, a creature that could come for us, sort of an idea, um, where we create maybe more of a narrative of something attacking versus something we could maybe consider particles more passive where we can control them a bit more, even if that's completely false sense of security. Um, maybe just psychologically, that seem, seems easier to us. So not 
wanting, wanting to belabor the asbestos point too much, given what's been going on. Um, while it's true that, um, I mean, we know about asbestos, we've known about asbestos for 20, 30, well, 40, 50 years at least, um, the reality is that it's, it's around us. I mean, you had a picture of asbestos. Um, it's, in the, it's a natural occurrence in the earth, so there is a certain amount of asbestos in the air anyway. The, the occupants of the Medical Sciences Building, and I was one of them for years, um, we're aware that there is asbestos in the building. Um, they're tr they're removing it as they as they go through construction, but um, people still have a pretty I would have to say almost an irrational feel uh, a fear of asbestos. It's the minute that word is spoken about, then people have a real fear of, of it. So I don't think just because it's a naturally occurring mineral, I don't think people are any more relieved to hear about it than anything else. I can say something different about minerals and, uh, and biological things. Um, so one of the other really interesting threads that I think goes between all three of of these works is the idea of palette. And it's been historically, to the extent that I know anything at all about art history, which is essentially nothing, but that, that's not going to prevent, prevent me from commenting on it, um, that, that we have long attempted to achieve representations of nature using things that are essentially mineral based. And there's a long, long history in art of striving to achieve natural palettes through the use of things that are inanimate. And uh, here you have this, this really fascinating transformation in mud, where from that mineral substance, by the presence of these microbes, the microbes themselves are actually able to represent the palate that traditionally has been a palate represented through minerals. And it's a striking palate. I mean, there were violets, there were, there were greens, there were, there were pigments that were represented in mud that are amongst the most toxic of paint pigments that have been used in history. Yet here you have these microbes that are able to produce these things fluidly. It's really, really stunning. So I think an interesting juxtaposition between all of these is is palette. You know, we have on the on the mineral side, we actually have things that are relatively subdued, and it's the microbes that, that are the ones that are that are representing you know the things that minerals typically represent. That wasn't the question. <laughs> it's an observation. Question. I'll, I'll make a comment, and then maybe the panelists can comment further. I was trying to think of um, some of the other ways in which the three presentations could be linked together. And one thing that came to mind was this matter of wonder, which Joel and Mick, and also Nicole Number One, mentioned um, quite explicitly. And, you know, if you think about the history of wonder, um, there are aspects of wonder that I think speak to each of the projects. So for Joel and Mick, you know, thinking about the matter of scale, I think is um, a really useful way because wonder, one aspect of wonder historically is uh, that kind of full-blown appreciation of things that are either gigantic or, or miniature. You know, we have this sort of, history of artists making sculptures on the head of a pin and that kind of thing. And so it, it seemed to me that one way one could think about wonder would be through scale, but also to think about astonishment that arises from alchemy, which is also part of the history of wonder. And I was thinking with Nicole number one, you know, the transform transformative aspects of the work over time are, are very alchemical in some senses. 
And then I guess for Nicole, number two, I'm just thinking about the the instruments. So you, you talked a lot about dust, which I guess we could think about in terms of the miniature scale in some way, ways, those particles that you were showing us. But then when you actually showed us your cabinets, you're not really showing us dust. You're showing us all of these objects that are that are wonderful in what they can do to um, <coughs> mitigate the, the sort of negative side of, of dust and what it does for you. So it seemed to me that wonder was a really a um, nice way of perhaps linking these quite diverse projects. And then I guess I would also think about performativity as well. Um, again, Mick and Joel mentioned that specifically, but I, I thought the mud was highly performative, which is why I would say to Nicole, number one, um, I, I'm not on board with your ideas of including those photographs in the installation because I think what the mud's doing is enough and it's dynamic and it's getting to the root of all those things you said you were interested in and I think the photographs have a potential to um, undermine you. Even though I know you're intrigued by their aesthetic beauty and also because of that sort of documentary history that leads up to what you do with, with the mud. So these are just some things you could think about. because it's, uh, it's the kind of thing that I think about a lot. So there, there's, a, there's a beautiful and, and really interesting contrast in that work because to look at, you know, it's, it's beautiful. It's almost a peaceful thing to look at and it's, it's slow movement. I mean, it's moving too slowly to be able to observe it in real time uh, unless you had a lot of time in your hands and you could sit in front of it, but, uh, which is possible, but it moves fast enough that as you said, if you visit it day after day, you see the changes. But that's, that's from the human perspective on the mud perspective. The perspective of the mud on the humans is very different. And having taken that mud from a relatively peaceful mm -hmm. habitat and having put it into that column and exposed it to light, suddenly you've done something that's, that uh, is causing those changes to happen in the mud. So what's happening from the mud's perspective is suddenly you've given it this massive flux of nutrient 
in the form of light, because the things that are producing these pigments are photosynthetic things, and they're all scrambling as fast as they can, which is relatively slowly, uh, to uh, make the best of, the, of what they can with that huge rush of energy that you've given them. So what's, hap what's unraveling inside each one of those columns is a war. It's a slow war. It's a war that happens at a time scale that's, that's you know, multiple phases out from our time scale. Uh, if we could slow ourselves down, we'd be able to see it. Um, but it's anything but peaceful. So we have these two uh, kind of uh, equal and opposite effects that, uh, that uh, from, from the perspective of the viewer versus the, the perspective of actually what's happening in the exhibit. So I think there, there are lots of stories that are really interesting, I think, about, uh, about that work. Um, yeah, I'm really happy you brought up the perspective of the microbes again, because uh, that's, that's been a big discussion for us, and it was a very uh, um, eloquent description of their perspective, um, which is what we've been trying to get at with some of our stories, um, and, uh, and the idea of these kind of violent transformations that can occur through uh, even a gust of wind or uh, the uh, creation of a bioaerosol and uh, a cloud that is seeded by microbes and then drop into a new location or become part of the skin temporarily. Right, um, and so uh, kind of a backstory to I think all of our projects and also Stefan is the Anthropocene. Um, and and, and uh, so looking at the, the mineral particulates, uh, of course, is very much a function of what we've done as a human species to geology on this planet. Um, and also we're thinking a lot about the Gaia hypothesis and in the endosymbiosis, which is this idea that ancient microbes became part of uh, eukaryotic cells uh, in order to deal with violent changes in the atmosphere um, and, uh, and kind of these wars between microbes. Uh, so the cyanobacteria that are in the mud uh, were producing a lot of oxygen, which was toxic to all the bacteria on the planet at the time. And there's a kind of response uh, in the creation of bacteria that were able to use oxygen that then became our mitochondria. These are all theories uh, still, but um, I think getting more more a solid basis in research. Um, and, uh, and then thinking about what new symbioses and uh, disruptions we we're creating as a human species uh, in the microbial world and in, the, in geologies uh, through our activities on an industrial scale. So. Well, I've already had two questions, so I'll defer. Let's see. Okay. There's a point about the war between uh, creatures. Uh, there's a military journalist, I think it was in Toronto, named Wire Dyer, and he recently wrote a book called Climate Wars, in which he discusses various scenarios, future scenarios uh, of what climate based on how bad things are going to get. And one of, the, one of the ones towards the end is what happens when the Gulf Stream shuts off and all the bacteria on the bottom that are currently poisoned by the, the oxygen-rich water coming through, all of a sudden are happy to start generating uh, sulfides which has a bad effect on the air if you're an air reader. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's, worth, it's, worth, it's, a, it's a book that's worth, worthy of, of looking at from that standpoint. Climate wars. Climate wars. Wind dyer. Um, both visually and in terms of the material you presented orally as well, about uh, by the distance, 
in a way, between our own time and what you were presenting, and then when we saw the cabinets again, that seemed to be underlined. You know, like a lot of those images you showed us were um, industrial mechanisms from the 50s, and then ads um, from the 50s, and we moved up to the 70s at one point, and we moved back to the 30s, but there was, there was this kind of distance, historical distance that um, seem to be maintained through your project. Could you talk a little bit about well, that distancing for you? Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, I think partly that's generated by the, by the date of, in which the instruments were used. So actually the instruments, I mean, the most recent instrument. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I think it's it's partly a reflection of the, the, the age of those instruments. So I think the earliest one, the condimenter, condimenter was, was, was used in the 30s. And I think um, perhaps the gravimetric dust sampler was 60s, I think. 60s, probably. So uh, it generally, it was just a reflection of um, tr trying to reflect the same kind of time period. as the, the Because the instruments they use today are, are not those instruments at all. Um, right. You know, they, they they're digital and they use um, chromatogra chromatography as well. Um, so, um, unfortunately, I, you know, if I were to extend this project, I would love to get into current technology, but um, this is strictly dealt with the, the history. Um, so, but, but you're still making the choices about which instruments to choose, right? So, I guess, what's the attraction for the earlier instruments as opposed to more contemporary uh, replacements. I mean, I, yeah. the, the, the nice thing about these instruments, uh, which are manufactured whenever they're manufactured, is like there's a real, um, uh, they're, they're, when you handle them, you can kind of learn and understand, you kind of know exactly how they work, which I think is really lovely. Uh, I don't think you get that with uh, <laughs> instruments today at all. I'd have no idea, but these are, they're very basic and very intuitive, which I, I, I love, and I love their form as well. So that, that's in line then with what you said at the outset of your presentation about your love of objects. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks. So just the other thing I, I might want to just interject here is that the kinds of pictures that Nicole, number two, was showing were pictures from probably North America, mostly. But you know, if you go to South America or to places in uh, Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, China, uh, you can see some of those things still happening. Um, there's huge differences throughout the world in terms of uh, how industry mismanaged, etc., etc. So some of what Nicole showed isn't necessarily totally historical. I mean, it is in North America, but not necessarily elsewhere. But the instrumentation that they would be using if they were to measure would be quite different because the technology has changed so much in the past 20, 30 years. So another thing that's really interesting to me about those instruments, um, I've always been sort of interested in the history of photography, and I particularly like still photography. And the difference between still photography and, and moving photography, uh, if you will, is sort of the same difference that we see between the instruments that Nicole looked at and the modern instruments. So all of the instruments that Nicole looked at are instruments that take a snapshot at a point in time of these particles or gases that we can't see. Pretty much all of the modern instrumentation is all moving pictures. Uh, they're instruments that collect data in real time and tell you something very different. And, and you, know, you use and integrate that information very differently. So looking at these old instruments that only allowed you to, to look at trends a snapshot at a time is a very different uh, mindset. So, and it's one of the things that I find very interesting about those instruments.
pies. So <laughs> I think we should uh, 